Hello and welcome to episode 30 of the Afro Mayo Driver podcast, brought to you by the Afro Mayo Owners Club. I'm Guy Swalbrick, and before I get onto the subject of this week's episode, I'd just like to mention episode 31, which will mark the first anniversary of the podcast, and we're going to be doing something rather different. For details of what we have planned, how you can get involved, and your chance to win a Built for Athletes Alfa Romeo Racing backpack worth $89.99, make sure you listen right to the end of the show. And why wouldn't you? This week, I'm joined by Andrew Banks, who, along with his brother Max, runs the legendary 105 performance parts and resto mod specialist Alpha Holics. Good afternoon, Andrew. Good afternoon, Guy. It's taken a long time to get together. I know you've been incredibly busy over the last couple of months. Is that typical or is are you particularly busy at the moment it's been extraordinary really since um i mean it's been building up over the last few years but it's been extraordinary since the first lockdown we've been unusually busy and i think that's probably attributable to a to, to a number of factors the main one being that um people have had a chance to to sort of sit back and work out what they want to do with their projects and a lot of people who've been putting things off and 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 saying next year next year and actually now the time's come when they've they've got a bit more time on their hands and they're able to focus on what they want to do and they've decided that now's the time to to progress those projects and 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 do what they've always been promising themselves and i think also in the first lockdown we saw a lot of people almost panic buying because they were they were worried they're going to be stuck at home in their garages or whatever and they needed things to do so we found people were were, were, were buying stuff like mad and um, and it seems to have continued there's a huge amount of interest out there at the moment in certainly in 105 series alpha and um, talking to other people in the trade everyone seems to be incredibly busy at the moment and, and is that both sides I mean there's, there's multiple sides to the business but is that both the, the part side of the business and the workshop Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the workshop side of the business has always been incredibly busy. We've always had far too much um, or more work than we can realistically manage. And we've always had a waiting list for GTARs. And that has actually increased uh, over the last 12 months. But it's really been the mail order side of the business, which has which has seen this huge uptick. And at the moment for us, it's just trying to keep up with demand is um, is the challenge. And are you having any problems at the moment sourcing products from, from elsewhere, particularly Europe? Or is, or is it... Okay okay so far it's certainly not as smooth as it was we could foresee last year that there were going to be some bumps in the road so we we overstocked last year and actually we've been quite so busy that 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 overstock has not lasted as long as we'd hoped but we have been able to get product it's just taken a little bit longer although there are signs now that that's actually settling down so i think it's i think it's something that will improve as time goes on and it's been that really allied with additional demand that's 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 created these challenges it's both been a um, delays in supply and also demand but what we haven't obviously we, we make quite a lot of our own stuff and so that's not really been affected so so we've been fortunate in that regard so we, we, we're kind of talking as everybody knows knows the business let's just take a, a step back and tell the story of the business from from i guess from when it started until when you got involved so alphaholic started in the late 90s but actually it goes much further back than that with the banks family it goes back to my father running production alfettas back in the late 70s and then after that he um he, he started to make a living by buying and restoring and selling the cars and so throughout the 80s he was making a name for himself and a a reputation for you know being you know the go-to person with some of the best 105 series around and you know he he won sort of countless concourse with the owners club and you know was was very active in that scene so you know it was an environment that max and i grew up it with uh grew up around the cars you know they both i remember when um both my mother and father had julia supers at the same time in the 80s i remember that quite clearly so it was really so alphaholic started in the late 90s and that was before max or i were involved in the business you know i remember my mother and father running things from home but it was it was really in 2005 when max joined the business and then i joined in 2006 that sort of we then began to progress it to a little bit more towards where we are today was that always the plan for you or what what did you see as your career as you were growing up surrounded by all of this well i went to university and did a law degree so i uh, whilst i had a great interest in cars and i began racing alphas it, i didn't really have an eye on alphaholics uh, as a business i was i was on a path to become a solicitor and it's in actual fact what i did i worked for a law firm for five years and they then reached a point when 
I was seeking a new challenge and, and, and I wanted to do something, you know, where I had a little bit more say in, in the direction the business was going. And at that time, it was it seemed like a great opportunity to 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 join the family business and really try and, you know, alongside Max, who was already there, was really t- try and take it to the next level. And, and it was at that point, I suppose, I made a, a huge change of direction in, t- in terms of my sort of personal career and never looked back since, really. And, and I suppose it's, it's useful to have a, a qualified solicitor on the staff <laughs> yeah i mean um it is and and uh you know we have certain um you know we have supply agreements and we have certain terms that we have in place with with, with our suppliers and with various you know people in our, in our industry and yeah it's always useful i mean not forgetting also max does have a, a legal background as well he right. um although he joined the he joined the business straight out of university so so he didn't go into practice but but yeah there are times when it's useful you get advice for less than 600 pounds an hour that's always good (laughs) yeah so what what did the business look like when you when you joined the business was it was very small I mean it was really you know it was a it was a double garage on the side of the house and back in those days we were you know still based at home and it was at it was in the middle of Exmoor it was very difficult in that sort of environment to be able to employ people. We were absolutely in the middle of nowhere. So the business was very modest. I mean, we'd already, right from the beginning, we'd already embarked on a, on a programme of developing uh, performance parts. So, you know, suspension kits and brake kits, they were already on stream even back in the early days. So I suppose Alphaholics was already on a path towards producing performance products for the cars, as well as all the restoration parts that that were available. So it was really a case of of Max and I putting our energy into expanding the business. And and I suppose the key factor in that was actually moving it to Clevedon, where we're based nowadays. And that happened in 2008. And, you know, that that was a huge driver to to, to where we are today. And it enabled us to, to, to employ people we had access to the local you know, employment market and we've got well we started off with one industrial unit we've now got three and yes it was a springboard for us to really develop Alphaholics to where it is today. And I guess the thing that that most people know you for these days and, and anybody who watched the the last series of, of Top Gear will have, have seen one is the GTAR that you mentioned earlier on. How did that project come about? It came about because we'd already started building a couple of these cars for our own use back in the, well, I suppose, starts off in the late 90s and early 2000s. And, and the car that was on Top Gear is, is the car that Max began building back in, uh, back when, I think, before he went to university, actually. And then it was in, I guess it was sort of 2008, 2009, we were getting more and more people approaching us and saying, oh, we really fancy that. Um, do you think you'd build one for me? And that was actually something that then prompted us to expand our premises uh, here in Clevedon because, you know, we were primarily a mail order business and we didn't have the capacity to really, although we had our own workshop, we didn't really have the capacity to be to be building many of these cars. But I suppose it was then, yeah, 2009, 2010, we really started the GTAR program and it's built built and um, built and built since then. You know, the cars share a, a sort of common philosophy, if you like, but. They, they seem to be pretty much all bespoke for for whatever the customer wants is that is that the case or is there a is there a core set plus plus options yeah there is a core set with, with a GCAR so that it um, there is a, a a minimum spec there's a minimum standard that we build the cars to so we don't really allow people to decontent the cars so really options end up being around color whether you have an early or a late car we have a step front or a flat front car. And then how you want to do the interior, how you might like to do the roll cage, depending on what the usage of the car might might typically be. But we do keep the base spec of the cars very high. That means that when you know there is an Alphaholics built GTAR out there, people know that it's built to a certain level, built to a certain mechanical spec, and built to a certain standard. So we we we're going to continue doing that. I think the waiting list is what seven years at the moment or something. Seven years at the moment, yes, yes. When you started to to sell the GTAR, did you ever imagine that there was a a seven year queue of people with two to three hundred thousand pounds to spend on a fifty year old car? I mean, we really had no idea when we embarked on the project. We we built the first car. It was a it was a great success. The the the, the owner loved it. And gradually the order sort of trickled in. But, you know, back then the cars were nowhere near the, the, the price they are now. But then they, they also they weren't we weren't able to offer the spec that we're able to offer now. So, 
you know, now we've got all sorts of options, including titanium and carbon and, and that sort of thing. So it's um, so really the the prices of the cars has gone up in line with the specification that we're now able to offer people. And, you know, there are cars now that we're starting to build where perhaps orders were taken three or four years ago. People hadn't necessarily envisaged the, the spec changes, but, you know, we could still build the car to the spec that they originally wanted. But actually now we're able to offer those options. And I think almost without exception, people are taking up the options and we ask whether they want to include this and include that because it's something we've developed in the meantime and the answer is invariably yes and so so yeah we could never have forecast the the popularity of the cars but you know it's a great position to be in and and you know the, if i win the lottery tonight and and come to see you tomorrow what what does the process look like do i need to do i need to bring you a 105 or can you source that as well and, and what do i do with my car for the seven years i wait <laughs> um yeah it's it's an option for the customer a customer can either bring us a car or we can source a car invariably we find ourselves sourcing cars because we already have a, a, a very good stock of donors which are perfect starting points for gtars so at the outset on the process there's a there's a deposit that books your place in the queue and then from that point on if there isn't a car available necessarily then we have a period of time obviously to find a suitable car be it a left-hand drive or right-hand drive or step front or flat front or whatever it might be and then that gives us a period of time and then once we've if we're sorting the car then the car can be uh, the car can be bought and then can be stored and then it's ready for the for the project start and equally with customers who are providing the car they could continue to use it if it's a using running driving car uh, otherwise um, it just sits and waits for their slot in the queue how many have you done so far what's the what's the current build list we're currently up to number 24 number 24 is in build and i think we're through to the mid 30s in terms of deposits so so there's plenty more to come so that's just a bit of rough maths. That sounds about just about one or just over one a year. It is. We typically do, yeah, between one and two a year, we're able to complete. That's that's sort of realistic. And um, people keep asking us, you know, will you scale the process? Will you produce more cars? And the answer is no, I don't think we will. We, you know, we're, we're absolutely adamant that we want to maintain the quality of the cars. Max and I sign off every single car that leaves here. So we know every single car. We've done all the development miles, all the shakedown miles and the debug miles in that car. And we can absolutely vouch for the quality of it. There's also, you know, there are a limited number of, of if you can believe it, 105s out there, which, you know, are, are right for a process like this. And, you know, it's not easy finding good, unrusty donor cars, which have all good stainless steel on them and all, all the parts that you cannot buy or or the quality is not good enough of the reproduction you know we need to reuse original and we i think there's a danger that you might start running out of cars if you if you churn them out at five or ten a year i know one of the most recent builds you did was slightly controversial because it had a very high proportion of bodywork made from carbon fiber was that a one-off or are there more carbon cars in the pipeline there are more on the way so we're doing a limited production run of cars but in actual fact, that was really just a, a, an evolution of the carbon openings that we have already offered for years. So we already do a carbon boot bonnet and door option. And really, this was this was just a case of taking the stage further and um, doing all the exterior panels in carbon. So that's obviously the roof and the wings and the front panel and the back panel. Uh, and then additional things like a spare wheel well and that sort of thing. So, you know, the fundamental, the chassis, uh, the fundamental structure of the car is the same, albeit strengthened. But, um, but it, you know, it is a, a, a 105 series chassis, steel chassis underneath, just outer panels in carbon. And the, the first one was painted. I know we, we talked about this a while ago. Is, is there anybody in the queue wanting to do a, a carbon look uh, clear coated version there are people flirting with the idea of doing it um <laughs> it's certainly possible i mean you you know you you have to pay great attention to the weave direction and making sure that that is all correct but i think overall everyone is favoring the option of, of of paint the one thing that we have that we've done on a car in build is there will be a clear coat stripe over carbon which that car will feature, which happens to look really nice, but the the rest of the car is painted. And and I quite like that look because it doesn't shout modified necessarily. The car still looks like a like a 105 series and um, it looks like it could be a steel body car. And I quite like that sort of subtle effect. 
And I guess there are, I mean, not typically alphas, but there were certainly lots of cars in period with black roofs and black bonnets. So I suppose you could you could do a half and half, couldn't you? And it would look right. Absolutely. You could. Yeah. And they they raced them in all sorts of different guises, as you know, and um, and all sorts of different color schemes. And, you know, that's part of that's an exciting part of the process that we go through with each customer is is they come down here and we we sit and we go through colors and we go through options and whether people want to do a stripe or, or what it might be. And that's a that's a really fun part of the specking process for, um, that we get involved with, with with customers. And it's it's fun doing that bit. And then leading on to that, of course, the interior as well and you know how we might incorporate leather and alcantara um into the into the pro into the trimming process and what seats we might use and you know whether the car you know if it's going to be a car that's predominantly used for track days you know how we might do the roll cage and trim the roll cage and whether we use alcantara or leather or whether we don't run a cage at all because the customer wants to use it to take his children to school so that's all fun part of the process i think working with the customer to produce what they really really want and although I'd, I'd been down to um, 20 open days and to a, a track day, the first time we met was um, at the Alpha GTA, GTAM launch back in, what, July, August last year? August, I think it was, wasn't yeah. it? Um, how did that come about? How did you get involved with, with that? And, and what, given your perspective on the the original GTA, GTA and GTAM, what do you think about the, the modern version? Well, I think that came about when Alpha were were keen to look back to their heritage, and you know they've they've made a big play about about harking back to the uh, to the philosophies of the original car, and of course you know the the GTA was all about the lightweight, and and now Alpha are using um, you know a lot of carbon with the the modern builds, not least the, the the GTA and the GTAM. So you know they were keen to to look back to the the original car, and and of course the huge amount of racing success that the original GTA had. I mean that was really Alpha. I think at its at its pinnacle, really, in in certainly in touring car racing, they the sixteen hundred and then the thirteen hundred had tremendous success, and um, we were. We, we're fortunate enough to to own um, one of the 1966 team cars, and um, you know that was a car that, that Alpha wanted us to take along to showcase on that event. And uh, I have to say, the new GTA and GTM look very impressive. I, th I believe the, the the press are getting their hands on them imminently, and yeah. we'll find out what they're really like. But uh, it's a dramatic looking thing, and um, hopefully it performs as well as it looks. I'm sure it will. And and I think given the given the starting point and all of the safety equipment and all of the regulations that they need to to comply with, it's it's as near to your philosophy as a as a mainstream manufacturer can probably get. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's very difficult for the manufacturers these days. You know, there are so many constraints, and you know, emissions legislation is simply one of those. But there are plenty of other. Um, criteria that these cars have to be able to meet i think it's very difficult for them to 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 produce um you know individual and exciting cars but i think you know the the new julia looks looks absolutely fantastic the new gta so you know hopefully alpha will have great success with that and talking of of journalists getting hold of cars you know people will have seen chris harris in the the gtar on on top gear and and there have been a few gtar reviews over, over the years what what kind of effect does that have on on demand do you literally get people phone up to to make an inquiry afterwards or is it is it all just part of of building the the legend of the car well we've never set out to really to chase the press and and to try and chase the coverage on the cars you know chris approach chris harris approached us a few years ago when he did the video that most people seem to have seen when uh, he drove the car at landau and he he thrashed it around landau all day and 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 uh, seemed to really enjoy himself and um it's amazing how many people have seen that video. I think it's great because I think it enables, you know, Chris is incredibly articulate and he's very good at being able to describe what a car feels like. And he's able to transmit what his feelings are as he's driving that car. And I think it's 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 wonderful that he's able to, you know, that he can do that with with our car and and. Um, no doubt that's enabled people to get a bit of an insight into what it's like to drive one of these cars and really up until that point we 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 hadn't 
had very much coverage at all. We'd sort of carried on doing our own thing. Obviously, we had our track day, and that's an, perhaps an opportunity for us to be able to take people out in the cars and showcase them a bit. But really, that, that video that Chris did was the first time that people across the world could, I suppose, get a real flavour from somebody you know, who's a very good driver and who's totally independent to be able to see what they're really like. So there's no question that, um, that that's, been, that's been great. And then, of course, there was uh, the recent Top Gear episode. And also uh, Jeremy Clarkson came down and drove the car and, and he thoroughly enjoyed it as well. And that was uh, that was seen by a lot of people in his column in the Sunday Times. So, you know, we've had, well, yeah, we, it's fair to say we have had a fair bit of press coverage recently. Weren't you a bit of a, a strange wild card entry into the Evo Car of the Year track day category a couple of years ago as well yeah we were yeah yeah the guys were um the guys were keen to have the car and and they had a huge amount of fun in it um i think it's been i, th I think it's been interesting because it's, it's opened people's eyes a little bit into in terms of you know we're not the only people doing these um you know term resto mods and and i think some of the journalists have been surprised at how well the cars perform and um you know how durable they are as well and you consider how much uh you know thrashing our our, our demo gtar gets with, with all the journalists and it just stands up to the um stands up to all the abuse so well so well, and, you, and, and you consider how little of it there is left i mean i, I mean that in the best possible way with you know <laughs> the, the drilled hinges and all of those kind of things you know the potential for it to not stand up i guess is is there but it does yeah i mean, I mean we've done a as, as, as you would probably know, we've done a huge amount of work behind the scenes. I mean, we, you know, I think back to the um, to the early days when we were going to the Nurburgring. You know, we're going to the Nurburgring in the mid two thousands with with these cars and, and and thrashing them round and round the track for sometimes days days on end at, at times. And you know, we did all our the aluminium dampers that we offer. All the development was done at the Nurburgring alongside places in Wales and, and locally as well. But a lot of the work was done there, and that really enabled us to fine tune the valving on the dampers and you know we've done road tours in europe we've been into wales um you know we when we were down in devon you know that that was fantastic on expo being able to do the development on all the roads down there that we knew so well so you know max and i have done a, done thousands and tens of thousands and tens of thousands of miles in these cars and and you know finding out you know what can fail and you know it might not be something you find out over over a couple of hundred miles it might be something you find out over five or ten thousand miles but you know we've we have done a you know a tremendous amount of work um in the background and before the before any journalist sees the car it's a horrible job but somebody's got to do it <laughs> exactly so so that's where we are now and if is there anything you can tell us about that is in development that might be an option for for some of the people who are only a couple of years into the queue well we've got an ongoing program with with some of the suspension development we're doing we are doing more and more components um in titanium it, it really can't be understated what a difference it makes to a car by shedding weight you know the racers will tell you this and you know some people will think it's it's very extreme when you start putting titanium all over the place but the it, it's something uh, you really notice when you drive a standard GTA against a steel body car with its, you know, its its, its original lightning um, components and, and the car is just so much lighter on its feet. Not only does it accelerate better, it stops better, it changes direction better. And, you know, we've seen that with with, with the GTAR program as we've got the weight down and, and um, particularly with a carbon body car, particularly with the cars that have got titanium components in the suspension. And now we've done um, titanium axle tubes as well. The difference is astonishing, and we're going to continue down that route of light weighting um, and um, and a few other things along the way, which uh, you'll find out about in due course. And and you mentioned the fact that there aren't there aren't that many 105s out there as a as a pool um, for for producing these cars. Is there any thought as to what you might do when that pool runs dry? Are there, are there any? alternative routes on the horizon i mean the the, the chassis are uh, the monocoque chassis are a, are a complex uh, series of pressings and a complex series of panels and and and, and not something which uh, anyone is easily going to be able to reproduce the other issue you have is over identities as well obviously you know you're only able to um you know to register cars with chassis numbers so I think uh, certainly for the foreseeable future, we'll be working with cars that already exist out there. And there are plenty of cars um, around, but uh, you know, there's a finite supply and 
we can't necessarily find them uh, find lots of them that quickly but every so often you know opportunities arrive and uh, arise and we're, we're able to to tuck a couple away but I don't think anything's going to change on that front necessarily and well, certainly not in the short term. And I, I guess there's nothing further on in, in Alpha's history that would actually solve that problem if you start looking at things like yeah, Alpha GTVs and and seventy fives. There aren't any of those out there either. No, I mean the, the the fortunate thing with the one hundred and five is it was the sort of the first sort of uh, really properly productionized um, car that Alpha produced. So they um, you know they tooled up really well and they uh, a lot of money was spent on on a, on, a, on a proper production line. And yes, of course the cars changed completely after the one hundred and five series when the Alfetta came along with the with the gearbox in the back. And it was a completely different thing. And um, but then yeah, not not many of them have survived. So I think you know it's been it's surprising how many cars are out there one oh fives, but um, you know we're you know we're really working with cars that are in a, a state of disrepair that aren't so bad that they're not starting points. But equally, we're not going you know we're not wanting to take cars that are beautifully original and preserved. That's 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 not what we want to do. Yeah. And we're looking for that sweet spot where there are cars that have been perhaps stored for many years or, or you know, stored in someone's garage or, or whatever it might be, and you know they're they're not easily restored, but they would be a perfect perfect candidate for a for a GTAR and of course now being able to produce carbon out of panels that then does get around some of the issues with um with 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 cars that are excessively rusty on the outside or or, or possibly accident damaged although you know that's not a route we want to particularly look at you know the cars need to be fundamentally sound and um and and, and ready for a for a build you know, there are there are a few GT juniors and things that have already been turned into uh, a GTA or GTAM replica after a fashion, and and maybe haven't been done you know to anything like the standard that that you would. Are they too far gone, or are they candidates to to be a, a base car? Well, one of the criteria we're always looking at when when selecting a suitable donor is cars, preferably that haven't had excessive welding they haven't been really got at before i mean you know you have to expect cars to have been repaired had rust repairs to a certain degree you have to be prepared to accept that but no it's certainly not a barrier at all there are um you know cars that have been restored once that we we could do the but you know the fundamentals must must remain the same you know the uh, all, all the they must be complete so all the bright work needs to be there and needs to be in good condition they need to you know they need to be fundamentally sound and uh, and not having been badly got at you know there are unfortunately there are plenty of cars that have been you know either accident damaged and repaired badly or, or rust repairs have been done badly and and really you know we we wouldn't be selecting those for for, for gtr programs but you know one of the things that we that we uh we, you know we talk about the gtar program a lot but actually you know one of the other things that we do is um uh, for people who who don't want to wait or who, who don't necessarily want to outlay all that money on a car they um you know they can bring us a, a fundamentally sound body shell and we can upgrade it to gtar spec and there are examples on our website where we've done that and so people have been able to get all the benefits in terms of the driving experience and the the trim work inside and everything without us having to uh do all the all the body work and it's the really the it's the body work which um which is the bottleneck in the whole uh, in the whole process because of the sheer number of hours that we're that we're putting into the the body shell to produce something which we know will last for many years to come and it's been is at the you know the standard that we want to work to um and then in addition to that people also have the option to simply buy the parts off the shelf you know that's you know we are we are essentially a mail order company that that's our core business and, and we always will be. And um, it's a great thing we're able to do with the workshop and, and, and the cars that we build is we're able to prototype and then we're able to um, productionize those particular products, whatever they might be, whatever upgrades they might be, and we're able to put them on the shelf in quantity. And that enables us to reduce the, uh, reduce the cost um, and offer them to people who want to build their own cars. And then they've got maximum flexibility. They can, they can order anything they want and, and it's also it's much easier for people who live on the other side of the world. We can, um, you know, we can build a crate and we can we can fill it with parts. And we've been doing a lot of that recently. So I guess if my numbers do come up, the best way to to jump the queue is to rather than offer you twice as much, is to bring you a car that's that's part way down the line already. Absolutely, 
absolutely you can do that and 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 yeah we um we do that here and then we also you know we work with other people who 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 upgrade the cars we use in the parts and you know and one thing we always like to do is to is to work with customers and give them the the, the backup and the help so that they can sort of produce the best possible thing the best possible car themselves and the one thing we haven't talked about is the racing side of things so Obviously, you and Max are both heavily involved in in that side of things. Did that start out as a way of promoting the performance modifications that you sell, or is that just you wanted to race? I think I think it's a bit of a combination of the two, really, Guy. You know, I started racing Formula Ford back in the late nineties and karting before then, and um, racing Alphas then was a natural progression. And it was really in the two thousands that we got quite involved in the Alpha Championship to a certain extent, but also going abroad because. Back in those days, we were developing a lot of extreme parts, a lot of performance parts in terms of suspension and brakes and drivetrain. And there were series on the continent, particularly the Dutch Alpha Championship, where we could take a 105 and we could we were able to run it within the regulations because they were allowing people to do all sorts of things. So that was quite exciting. You know, we developed the car, we were running on slicks. You know, we had some trick, uh, trick suspension um, back in those days, the car was very light and we had a lot of fun doing that. So, you know, that that sort of worked well with our with our development program, our performance parts development program. And also it helped to raise the profile of the business. And then really it was I suppose it was 20, 2010 when we built the 1600 GTA to FIA Appendix K spec. We took a different change of direction. And of course, we weren't able to use all the, uh, you know, the, the products that we developed for modified racing. We had to, you know, we had to stick to FIA, but that was a, we wanted to give it a try. And we wanted to, um, you know, that was clearly a, a popular and exciting way to go racing and, and certainly very competitive in, across Europe. And that was something we wanted to have a go at. And I suppose now that's what we're, we're better known for is, is, is campaigning our GTA and U2TC. And uh, is, is that uh, an aspect of the business as well? Will you prepare other people's FIA spec cars or is that just your own? We, no, we prepare other people's cars. We've, we've, we've done that over the last few years. And, um, you know, we have customers racing, racing GTAs that we've prepared and, and, and we continue to support. But in terms of actually going racing and Alphaholics being a presence at the circuit, that's something that we do ourselves. So we don't run any anyone else as such, but we do provide you know technical support to to um, to owners of, of those cars. And you you talked about the the Yock and Rint car that you had at the the GTA GTAM launch. How did um, how did that come into your possession? Well, that was interesting because that was a uh, Max had a contact in in Sweden, and um, so we'd known about the car for quite some time, and the the owner was was we 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 had an interest in owning the car and um but the owner was quite reluctant to sell it and we said well if you're ever you know if you're ever interested then then you know we we'd, we'd love to own it and we'd love to, to to be a custodian of that car for the you know for for many years to come and um in the end um the phone call came and and, and we were fortunate enough, enough to buy it and um the wonderful thing about that car was how original it was it, it it raced in period very successfully and did a lot of racing in the early years but then it um it didn't do a tremendous amount after that and so it was wonderful because it came with so much original stuff and it's original seat that Yock and Rint drove the car in that is the seat that's in the car completely untrimmed and all the the Prover sheets that came with it and 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 just the history was just astonishing for that car so yeah we count ourselves very lucky to to own that it's a time of huge change in the automotive world at the moment with mega corporations like Stellantis emerging, changes in environmental legislation. What do you think the future holds for companies like yours and for the classic car scene generally? EV is the word on people's lips these days. and um, But I think I'm, you know, the more and more I see and I think the future's bright for, for classic cars. And, you know, the, the one thing that actually I haven't talked about in relation to GTAR, but it's actually very pertinent um, with modern supercars, is that we're finding a lot of customers craving the driver interaction that you get with um, three pedals, a gear lever, and and no traction control and no ABS, and and and, and also the you know the lovely way these cars, particularly 105 series cars, drive. You know we're we're fortunate that. The cars were beautifully engineered back in their day and handled very well in their day. So, you know, the purpose of our of our GTARs is simply to enhance the character of the car and not necessarily 
modify it just to make something that's objectively faster or, or a lap a circuit faster. You know, we're trying to enhance the character of the car and bring out more of the character in terms of the way they drive. And, you know, that's deliberately why we retain the live axle setup on the, on, on the GTARs. And we also retain the original steering box setup because, you know, those are, when you drive one of these cars, those are the features that really shine through. So, you know, we're looking to enhance the character of the cars. And I think people, you know, a lot of our customers have owned modern supercars, whatever manufacturer they might be, and they, you know, they're, they want something which they're, where they're a bigger part of the whole process and perhaps they can have the fun at slightly lower speeds than, than these modern hypercars uh, seem to operate at. And, you know, I think that's something that we're going to see more and more of as the years go on. People wanting to go into historic to find the fun that they that they really crave. So there could actually be be more demand as as the only thing you can buy new is electric i think for the fun yeah i mean i think well i, I can envisage a time when we're, we're probably all going to have to be driving electric cars from day to day it, 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 i could see it happening perhaps but i still think there's going to be space for um driving for fun and driving for enjoyment and and i think that's where cars like these and like porsche you know the old 911s and stuff that's where the fun will be and classic cars i think will will be able to fulfill that brief um so i think we'll only see more and more interest as as time goes on and i guess all you need is is one or two people a year until seven years before you plan to retire uh <laughs> i won't know what to do i think we'll <laughs> <laughs> i think we'll be here for some time yet hopefully and um and, and doing more of the same brilliant well andrew it's been an absolute pleasure thanks for taking the time to be with us this afternoon thank you for having me well, that's almost all we've got time for this week, but there are a couple of things I'd like to talk about before we go. The first is our anniversary podcast, which will be available from 1.30 on Sunday, May the 9th, from YouTube, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and all the usual podcast sources. I'll be joined by Arock Elves Club Chairman John Griffiths, Mito Registrar David Faithful, and GT Registrar and Thames Valley Section Secretary Kirsty Hodson, who have pulled together a load of really quite interesting facts about Alfa Romeo. The show's called No Such Thing as a Brera Quadrifolio, and there's an opportunity for you to contribute your favourite fact to the show. Not only that, the member who sends in our favourite fact will receive that fabulous Built for Athletes Alfa Romeo Racing backpack. It's a fantastic bit of kit. It's the updated version of the bag that we gave away in last year's photo competition, and David and I liked it so much we bought one. To be in with a chance of winning, you need to send us your favourite fact, with a source if you have one, to editor at aroc-uk.com, with alpha fact in the subject of the email. We'll try to work as many facts as we can into the show, and you can find all the details of the competition on the club website. The second thing I wanted to do is to thank you all for waiting so patiently for tickets for National Alpha Day to go on sale. We're not quite there yet, but they should be available in the next week or so, and we'll have a preview of all the attractions in a forthcoming episode. That's it for now, so until the next episode, stay safe. <laughs>